Sunday in October. It's anniversary Sunday too today, so can I hear a happy anniversary, St. Andrews? <laughs> Our hundred and this congregation is 187 years old today, 187 years. So that's quite an accomplishment. And here's to 187 more years. And uh, on a sadder note, we extend our deepest sympathies to the family of Sheila Ferguson, who passed away earlier this week. Uh, the Reverend Bates conducted the funeral at the Oshawa Funeral Home yesterday. And would you please keep the Ferguson family in your prayers? Uh, next week, we celebrate communion. And we also set our clocks back an hour. We return to standard time next week. So before you go to bed, set those clocks back an hour, enjoy your extra hours of sleep, and then come for, come for, come for communion next Sunday morning. Um, as always, if you or anyone you know has a pastoral need, uh, please contact Reverend Biggs by calling the church office. You may also contact your, uh, your elder. And a general welcome to everybody for coming out. Um, those in our fellowship who are watching this service online, hello. And no matter who you are or where we are, we are together in spirit today. Uh, if you could please stand and prepare for the entrance to the Bible in the opening praise selection.
In Psalm 150, we hear words of praise in any way that we can bring it. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with strings and flute. Praise him with the sound of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let us pray. Loving God, we bring to you this day our worship. We show our love for you and our dedication to you by being here in this place to hear your word, to ask for your voice, to touch our hearts, that you might equip us to live out our lives of faith with even more strength and courage and steadfastness. We bring the gifts of our hearts and our lives. We bring our ability to raise our voices in song, truly an act of worship and praise and adoration. We lift up our voices, even though we can't sing. We can hum along or we can say the words to the music. We can think these things quietly in our hearts. But in all of these things, we praise you. So accept the worship of our hearts and our lives that we bring to you this day. Accept the love that we have for you because we've seen in you your incredible love for us. Forgive us where we fall short of the life of Christ that we see lived out in the pages of the scripture. Forgive us when we fall short of living out the fruit of the Spirit that we'll read about and talk about later on. Forgive us our pride. Forgive us our inability to forgive even when we accept your gifts of forgiveness so freely. We bring our hearts to you and ask for your healing. And we ask that you bring about healing through our faith, through our forgiveness, and through our gifts of time and energy and love, all dedicated to you. Here these are prayers in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray as we pray together now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I don't know about you, but I think probably everyone in this room at some point in time has checked off their parents. Goes without saying they take us off too. But one of the things that I rejoice in when I was younger, and maybe took for granted, but remember with much fondness now, is that no matter what I did that hurt their feelings or how I failed them or didn't live up to their expectations, they were always there for a hug and a word of forgiveness and a word of encouragement. The other part of that whole thing was that no matter how much I felt forgiven and given another chance by my mom and dad, as soon as my brother did something to me, I lost my temper and didn't maybe forgive him very easily. And there's a story in the Bible about that too, about how someone was forgiven for doing a horrible thing. And then when someone did this little thing to them, they wouldn't forgive. And how God calls us to accept not only the gifts of forgiveness from our parents and from God, because that's what our parents and what God just do because they love us, 
But we're also called to, to forgive each other and to care for each other and to give each other another chance too. I remember when I was about five years old, I had a friend, and we fought almost every time we got together about something. And we'd slam the doors, and we went to, we lived across the street from each other, we could hear each other's doors slamming as we ran into our house because we were so mad at each other. And we'd have supper, and then within five minutes of supper being over, there'd be a little on the door, and one of us would be back saying, you want to play some more? When we don't forgive, it hurts. Not only the other person we don't forgive, it hurts us too. It robs us of our friendships. It robs us of our love. It hurts our relationships with our family and our friends and with each other. So remember today when you ask God for forgiveness for something, or your mom or dad forgive you, remember that we're all called to be forgiving just like that. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that no matter what we say or do or even think, you forgive us. Your love for us is perfect and you always give us another chance. Help us not only to enjoy that gift of being forgiven and to be thankful for it, but also help us to live out our own lives being thankful and forgiving people too. Amen.
You work in us and then you work through us that others might experience the love of Christ. And we thank you for this and every opportunity that we have to present to you our gifts. And we dedicate the gifts of money that we bring to. And we know that you will bless them and use them for incredible things. From the great gift of the food bank to our community, to all the other ways in which this, this church, this family of faith, lives out its faith in you, in our homes and in our workplaces and in our schools. We pray, Lord, now that you will speak to us out of the riches of the scriptures. We read familiar stories this day, but speak to us out of your eternal truth, that we might find out something just a little bit different, touch our hearts in a new way, encourage us where we need to be encouraged, and kick us where we need to be kicked. Get us moving in your way, in your path, to the glory of Christ. Amen. Good morning. Our first scripture reading is Psalm 71, verses 1 through 6. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, rescue me and deliver me. Turn your ear to me and save me. Be my rock of refuge, to which I can always go. Give the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of those who are evil and cruel. For you have been my hope, sovereign Lord, my confidence since my youth. From birth I have relied on you. You brought me forth from my mother's womb. I will ever praise you. Our first New Testament reading is Galatians chapter 1, verses 13 to 25. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. My immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. The second New Testament reading is taken from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. The Parable of the Good Samaritan On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, 
brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. wonderful that Andrea could join us like that today and electronically with reading the scriptures. Being a school teacher and being in contact with dozens if not hundreds of kids over the course of the day, she doesn't feel comfortable being here and what she might be able to bring into this place with her because of all her work within in the school. So our prayers are with her and with all teachers and all who don't feel comfortable being here because they want to keep all of us safe. Paul wrote, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit has to do with character. In these words, we see the character of Jesus Christ. We also see the character that Jesus can create in his people. Think about that. Really? Us? Does that sound like you or me when you read that list? When I hear this list read, I feel a sense of frustration. Hearing this passage reminds me of what is lacking in my life. I know there's an absence of love for certain people in my life. At times, I don't feel joyful at all. Sometimes, there's no peace in my heart. Sometimes, I'm not patient. Sometimes, I act without a shred of goodness or kindness. Sometimes, I fall short in faithfulness and trustworthiness. Sometimes, I feel quite proud of myself. My guess is that you feel this way sometimes, too. But really, the only person who has possessed these qualities in perfection is Jesus himself. But as we look at them, if we really are God's children, don't we wish that God's perfections could also be found in us a little more often? It's really frustrating to the wisdom of this age that we can't produce the fruit of the Spirit in our lives by trying really, really hard. The good news is that this fruit is a gift that comes to us when God lives within us. When we are Christ's people, the character of Jesus can be seen in us. Can you imagine the perfections of Jesus in you or me? Wouldn't that be fantastic? And that's why it's so vital for us to study this passage and see what it's all about. Perhaps you need a message of hope today. Perhaps you have become frustrated with how far short you feel you've come up, struggling to measure up to the kind of man or woman a child of God should be. Perhaps your failures have almost caused you to give up hope. Let this sink in again. The only one who can live the life of Jesus is Jesus. We can never do it in our own power. The good news is that Jesus, living in us through the Holy Spirit, is able to live his own life in us, but also through us. But only if we let him, we have a choice to make. Joyfully, Paul proclaimed, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Living by faith in the Son of God, who lives inside us, is what the fruit of the Spirit is all about. This passage teaches us about how God works in us to produce the very character 
of Jesus. The minister of Bethany Bible Church in Portland, Oregon, tells us that we begin to understand how this fruit is produced in us by looking at the title, the fruit of the Spirit. This reminds us that the character, the qualities of Jesus, are not something that we produce by our own hard work or determination. They are not produced by us. They are produced in us. Probably some of you have tried this one as a child. Around the corner from where we lived, there was an apple orchard. All the local kids loved the excitement of hopping the fence to pluck a nice red apple from the tree. Once in a while we'd get caught and we'd run away from the farmer. But that only added to the excitement. One day, when I was on the other side of the fence, I broke a branch off the tree, took it home, and stuck it in the ground, hoping that I could grow my own apple tree. But of course, those apples never came. I thought that the power to create apples was in the little branch. But the branch only bore the fruit. It did not produce the fruit. And as long as the branch was cut off from the tree, the branch couldn't do anything. Remember how Jesus talked about this? He said, Abide in me, and I will abide in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. To think that you or I could read this list of the fruit of the Spirit and believe that all that we need to do is roll up our sleeves and get at it. To conform to the list in our own power would be the same as cutting a branch from the apple tree, sticking it in the ground and believing that it will produce apples. It is the Spirit that produces the life of Jesus in us. It's also good to note that Paul speaks of the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits of the Spirit. It is singular. The fruit of the Spirit is not nine different fruits, but one fruit that is revealed in nine different qualities. It's also a reminder that we can't pick and choose which qualities we'd like for ourselves. It's all or nothing. When we try to separate them, we say things like, I need the Holy Spirit's help with patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, but I have the other ones pretty well down pat, especially meekness and humility. We can't take the ones that appeal to us or seem easier to us and neglect the rest. It's not a buffet. It's not like going to the Mandarin. Take a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And sometimes we take a lot more of this and none of that. And, especially if we go with our parents, we can't pick, up, pick all the cakes and the ice cream and all our favorite things and ignore what we don't like, especially if it's vegetables. Like a parent who's always watching and reminds us that we need to eat our vegetables, even Brussels sprouts, the fruit of the Spirit says, even if one of them looks like a Brussels sprout, it's still part of the deal. It's who you're called to be. Human effort cannot produce even some of the fruit that the Spirit wants to produce in us. Jesus asked, Do people gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. And every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, as it's useless. The fruit of the Holy Spirit, then, is one fruit. If the Spirit is going to develop any characteristic of that fruit in us, then the Spirit is going to develop them all. 
Another thing that's important to remember is that fruit does not grow overnight. From the time of the blossom to eating the fruit is a period of several months. The fruit of the Spirit does not grow overnight either. It takes a lifetime. There's no quick fix, no easy way to live in our lives with the character of Christ. And as an apple tree endures strong winds and storms, hot and cold insects, and little kids with an adventurous spirit, so we endure much as the fruit matures in us. Trials and tests, partings, pain, loneliness, all challenge our growth. Billy Graham wrote, if life were always kind to us, if people were always pleasant and courteous, if we never had headaches, never knew what it was to be tired or under terrific pressure, the fruit of the Spirit might go unnoticed. But life is not always like that. In the midst of difficulties and hardships, that we especially need the fruit of the Spirit. And it's in such times that God may especially work through us to touch other people for Christ. As we bear the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, others will see in us the family likeness of God's own Son and be attracted to the Savior. God will use these things to help us to grow and our fruit to mature if we let Him. We can also use it as an excuse to give up. So what does this fruit look like? The list at first might seem quite random, but they're grouped quite logically into three smaller groups. The first three, love, joy, and peace, have to do primarily with our relationship with God. The second three, patience, kindness, and goodness, have primarily to do with our relationships with other people. And the final three, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control have to do primarily with our own inner state of being. Looked at that way, the fruit that the Holy Spirit produces in us will have an impact on every relationship we could possibly have. The good news for all of us today is that I'm not going to take time to spend describing all these nine characteristics of the fruit or even to look at the three groups of them. But I would like to say that our culture that says, if it feels good, just do it. Look out for number one. If you think it's true, it must be true, even if it's just true for you and not true for me. All these never acknowledge that there's an awful lot of people in prison because they've chosen to live like that. There are a lot of broken homes and even broken churches because one or more family members have chosen to live like that. Suffice it to say for today that all these different qualities in the fruit of the Spirit give us a crystal clear picture of Jesus himself. He displayed perfect love for us by giving himself for us on the cross. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. He experienced perfect joy and said to us, I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. He experienced perfect peace and said to us, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. The Bible entrusts our eternity to the patience of Christ who forgives us and always gives us another chance. The Bible reminds us of the riches of God's kindness toward us in Jesus. Scripture also encourages us by saying that the good works that Jesus has begun will be completed as we live out our lives in faithfulness. The Bible talks of Jesus as the one who is faithful and true. One who, though in the form of God, as quote the scriptures, humbled himself and became one of us, obedient even to the point of death, death on a cross. He showed us self-control and that for the joy that was set before him, 
He endured the cross. For the Holy Spirit to show His fruit in us, it's the very same thing as having the very qualities of the life of Jesus being shown in us, in our lives. It is the Holy Spirit living the life of Jesus Christ in us and then through us. And isn't that something that we all yearn for? To live like Jesus lived? God offers this to us as a gift, a free gift, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's not something we go off on our own and try to do. All we need to do is allow the Spirit to work in us and through us, revealing to us and then to the world the presence and character of Jesus himself within us. My wife Linda's dad is with the Lord now, but I used to love watching him in his garden. In fact, I love watching anybody garden as long as I don't have to do it. Because I hate gardening. Gardening is like cutting the grass once a month even if it needs it, doesn't need it. But it was always peaceful and joyful to watch him delight in everything that he did in his garden. He worked hard. It was a big garden. And he was a perfectionist. In all the years I watched him, though, I never saw him grow anything. In fact, we can't grow anything. God himself gives the growth, and he knew it. All Harold did was make sure that the environment was right for growth to happen. And he sure did that. That is so true when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Only God gives the growth. But it's our responsibility to make sure the environment is right for growth to happen. So how do we do that? Before the Holy Spirit can produce God's fruit in you or me, that Spirit must be living inside us. This happens when we believe that Jesus is who He says He is, the Son of God. And we are saved by God's grace through faith in Him. Where it begins is with our faith in Jesus as our Savior, the one who died on the cross so that our sins might be forgiven and our eternity secured. It comes when we decide to follow Him with our lives. Secondly, we all need to clean up our lives where we fall short of the character of Jesus. Living in a way that consistently dishonors Christ prohibits the fruit of the Spirit from being a part of our lives. We need to ask for forgiveness and allow Jesus to take away the sin and the guilt. Then we need to, as Paul says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us keep step with the Spirit. As we mature and our fruit grows, we'll be more and more in tune with what God wants of us. We will sense God's leading, God's will. And we will do what God asks of us through the scriptures, through prayer, through a knowledge of the character of Jesus and a desire to be more and more like that. When we don't feel so loving or patient or faithful or meek or kind, we are to entrust ourselves to the work of the Spirit to produce those things in us. And as we do, we discover that the Spirit is producing more and more fruit as we go along. May we increasingly allow the Holy Spirit to produce His fruit in us. And may Jesus Christ be glorified as we live our lives with the same character that He showed to us. Barbara Rieberg wrote a little poem entitled, The Greatest Test. Help me to walk so close to thee that those who know me best will see I live as godly as I pray. And Christ is real from day to day. I see some once a day or once a year. To them I blameless may appear. It's easy to be kind and sweet to people whom we seldom meet. But in my home, 
are those who see me too many times to know that I'm always at my best. They see the worst of me too. My hymns of praise were best unsung if he does not control my tongue. May no one stumble over me because thy love they fail to see in me. Give me, Lord, a life that sings and victory over little things. Help me with those who know me best, for Jesus' sake, to stand the test. And whatever your test may be, may everyone around you see the fruit of the Spirit in how you respond, how you live, how you forgive, how you live. Amen.
they were already, already there, so I guess it was time to say hello. So I invite you today, with certainly with distancing involved, to. Uh,